Hi, Misha here, and this time I thought it might be fun to talk about five overrated AKs, or AK-type guns. Now, these will be five that I own, so obviously they are not guns that I don't like, or that I think are bad. I just think that the kind of hive mind, the common lore, the wisdom groupthink has kind of put them on a pedestal a little higher than they deserve. So I kind of want to bring them back down to reality, to what they really are and are not. But first, a gun here that I actually think is pretty, pretty well acknowledged. Of course, this is my uh, Sam 7SF. We've recently had another batch of these finally come in. Notice the original ones were all 2013 dated and now this batch they're all 2020 dated so truth is they didn't come in for seven years they were simply selling off existing stock that long yeah i really do think this is pretty pretty fairly rated on the market uh non-hype prices and consideration because it is a true import it's really the only true milled receiver gun import left Arsenal of Bulgaria is about the only con company that makes milled receiver AKs. It's a hot die forged receiver, not a casting. It does have a true cold hammer forge, chrome line barrel. Arsenal did update their uh, tooling a couple of decades ago with some new stuff from Steyr. No, these are not Steyr barrels. Some people think that. That's not what they say. They say they use Steyr technology. There's a difference. And it has full features like bayonet, lug, muzzle brake. And a folding stock, which if there's ever any other kind of ban, such things are nice to have. Plus it does have a scope rail, and it does have a left side kind of Galil style selector. And what I really like about it is that, um, yeah, it it's based on the military gun. So I, I think these are pretty fairly represented. At one time I'd say they were they were undervalued, underappreciated, but now it seems like they've kind of gained uh, gained some traction. So that kind of gives you an idea of something I think is uh, fairly judged, more or less. And with that, let's just kind of get into our first overhyped AK. First up, the Hungarian FEG SA85M. This is a pre-ban brought in by Kastner between around 19... 87 and 1989 and it's kind of an interesting one to put on this list because for a time these were truly undervalued but the market seems to have shifted and people make these out to be the cat's pajamas they are very good guns but they're not the end all and be all they have a typical paint finish most of them you find will be the underfolder, like mine here. I think the fixed stocks are a little more interesting, but there's a little bit fewer of them out there compared with the underfolders. You do get, of course, full features, bayonet lug, threaded barrel. The barrel is cold hammer forge, chrome lined. The receiver is standard 1.0 stamped, so on and so forth. So what's the problem? There really isn't a major one, but people, one thing I just want to say, and this is a technical point, people think of these as being AKMS exact colognes. They're not. They're based on the Hungarian AK-63D, which is their own variant. It um, is similar to an AKMS, but different. Notice the pistol grip. Notice the non-lightning cut bolt carrier. Most noticeably, notice the, sl notice the slab side handguards, and the handguard retainer is a uh, different shape. And there are a few other small differences. So it's not a true AKMS as such. It is FEG's own twist on it, much as they did with the AKM-63 and AMB-65 before. A lot of it has to do with the pricing. Um... It is a good gun, 
The machining is nice, but to read some posts, it's stellar amazing. Mm, these are still made in a Comblock factory. So you will still get Comblock levels of quality. But it is the lowest on my list because I, I do think it's a nice gun. But on the other hand, when I find myself grabbing my various AKs or wanting to go shoot them or just thinking about them, this one often just doesn't come up. For whatever reason, it just doesn't quite trip my trigger. I mean, in speaking of, things like the trigger, the bolt travel, they are nice, but they're not buttery smooth. I definitely think, for example, that arsenal we just had up on the table has a better trigger and smoother bolt, at least in my experience. But yeah, number five, I, I think this one may be getting a little more acclaim than it's worth. And a lot of that has to do with there are few of these out there. And a lot of people have never put hands on one, only seeing them in pictures. And when you see things in pictures, especially with the mystique of being a pre-ban, um, it may get a little inflated. And with that, let's move on up the list. Number four, the SGL-31. Really just standing in, in general, for all Russian Izhmash Sega types, or even kind of including Russian Molot Beppers if you want to get there. Both are now sanctioned, not allowed in for further import. The Segas were banned in June of 2014, and the Vepers in June of 2017. And since that time, they've really shot up in value, as anything that gets banned will do. But, the Segas were once cheap guns, the unconverted Hunter ones. They were under 200 bucks, and even the converted SGL-21s with fixed stocks were retailing for 500 at the end of 2009. So they were very good values for what they were. And for that, people overlooked a few things. Over the years, we noticed a few issues, nothing major, mostly all cosmetic. For example, sloppy markings, uh, the fact that they have a paint job that's not the best in the world. Uh, sometimes you had overly tight gas tubes or top covers, or conversely, overly loose ones, um, things like that. And of course, since they were cheap, many of them were bought up and converted and altered. But since the uh, sanction, to hear it, these are the best AKs ever and just top, tippy top top. Now it's true that they're made in Russia, which is great, as I've said in many videos. The fact that we got a military style AK out of Russia at all is a minor miracle. But, again, since not everyone can put hands on them now, and since they have been sanctioned for a few years now, and there's a whole new generation of gun owners that never had a chance to buy one before, they're starting to get a mythical status. I really like this gun. You know it's at the top of my favorite list. But I also want to be realistic about it. These were mass-produced in Russia. They were imported in large numbers here. And they were, for the most part, converted and sold as shooting-level guns. They were not built to a collector grade, to a high, high, high standard. They were built to a usability standard. So if you look to buy a Sega... First off, I really do like the SGLs for various reasons we've gone into in other videos, but if you get a converted one, make sure you know who converted it. I guess what I'm getting at is not all Segas are equal, and even the best ones are still going to have some blemishes in the paint, and um, they're going to maybe have a little bit of a sloppy marking. I don't know. I just feel like they're being put on a little higher pedestal than they deserve. That said, I don't want them to get knocked down. I don't want them to be considered bad. I just would like people to be realistic about these, what they are, and also the fact that there are tens, hundreds of thousands even of these in America. 
and the the Segas and Vepers put together, probably a million. So, if you want one, great. Just maybe don't spend four four grand on it. My humble opinion. But um, yeah, I just I want to bring these down to reality. It's still a gun I love, but. I recognize that it is not without its minor shortcomings, let's say. So that's why it's not terribly high on the list, but it really needed to be mentioned. And the same can be said for Vepers. They're very great guns, but, you know, be realistic about them, that's all. Number three, the Egyptian Mahdi. Boy, this has had an interesting history in America. <laughs> Steyer imported about 2,000, some say 2,500 back in the 80s. And they didn't sell well. They were extremely expensive back then. 700 bucks, which is uh, over 1,500 easily in today's money. And they were competing with other imports like the Chinese. So really another batch came in. Until the 90s, after the 89 ban. And uh, you'll see some. Pars was an importer. Mine here is from Intrac. And then later, Century Arms would import these up through the early, early 21st century. And then they would finally discontinue. And they would go under several names. ARM, um, RML, and then later, MISR, MISR. And there would be MISR, MISR 10. Mr. 90, which isn't a true Mahdi, and then the Mr. SA, just to name a few. So why is it here? <sighs> a couple of things. One of the big selling points for these, especially in the 80s and 90, early 90s, was they advertised that these were built on Russian tooling to Russian spec to Russian blah, blah, blah. They even shipped a certificate with a lot of these saying that. That's great. This is true. Unlike the Hungarian... These were made pretty much to exact Russian AKM specification. Here's the thing. So are most guns. I mean, where do you think Poland, Romania, East Germany, etc. got their tooling and support? They all started with Russian tooling and assistance. That doesn't make the the Egyptians special. The same could be said for Wasser's. But when people think about AKM, this is one of the best true AKM ports with the SAR-1 or other early Romanians being another. But on top of that, the fit and finish. They have a paint finish on them, which is well known for being sometimes bubbly, gloopy, too heavy, too light, um, scratched up. The funny thing is, that's actually Russian spec. If you look at a an AKM made for the Russian military in the, in the 1970s, they weren't super pretty. The paint was there to protect against rust. So that's actually authentic. But don't get one expecting a beautiful, shiny paint job. It's kind of a, a semi-matte black finish. Another thing, the, the wood can be pretty iffy. As you can imagine, uh, Egypt doesn't exactly have a lot of forest. Now, they imported a lot of the wood, but nevertheless, a lot of the times you'll get one and they will have mismatched wood. I've also had quite a few with loose wood, either lower or upper pieces. And that's another thing. The, the, the fitment is all over the place with Mahdi's. Dust covers can be overly tight, or loose gas tubes I've often seen canted even you know mine is here a bit the, the worksmanship is not stellar it is functional these do run ex very well yeah come back. but if you look here you can see how it lips over I mean it doesn't affect function but it's a cosmetic thing because this is actually canted a little bit when they welded it onto the tube and the triggers on Mahdi's are not good. They're probably durable, but they're heavy and crunchy and not great. And the bolt throw is fine, but nothing to write home about. Yeah, so the fit and finish is really... You know, Romanian guns get a lot of grief, and sometimes it's well-deserved, but 
on, I'll put, I'll give you this story. When I bought my SAR-1, I had my choice between a Mahdi or an SAR-1 in the gun shop, and they had several there to pick from. That was around 2000, 2001, something like that. Going through maybe four or five Mahdi's, four or five Romanians, I quickly came to the conclusion, and so did the people at the shop, that the Romanians generally looked better, had a nicer finish, and had nicer wood furniture. Now, both have cold hammer forged chrome line barrels, all that. Now, everything I said, mine is a early post band gun because it has the threaded barrel, but the bayonet lug was lightly ground off. Why don't I have a Steyr pre band? Well, they're the same. Uh, the, the quality of the Steyr imports, like the fit, the finish, is not much higher than your early post bands. The only real difference is the bayonet lug. And I just did not feel like paying two or three times the price just to get a couple of little wings. For that, you can always drink Red Bull. Now these were, at least the post bands, undervalued for a while. You could pick one up for five, six, seven hundred dollars lightly used. But nowadays, the post band guns are starting to go for crazy money is sometimes as much as some other pre bands and that is the, this is not a $2000 gun is a is a post band and consequently the pre band Steyrs while they're nice enough they are not $3000 guns objectively speaking they're just not for 3 grand you can get some pretty darn nice guns so i definitely think the Steyr Mahdi's, once kind of passed over for cost, should probably still be passed over for cost. And uh, the uh, the postman ones, once kind of a little bit derided and undervalued, are now probably overvalued. We've often said in videos, it, at the very most, they're on par with the Romanian SAR-1. And it seems like currently SAR-1s are selling for quite a bit less than Mahdi's, and that, that just seems weird. But, uh, yeah, and I think people buy into the made-on-Russian tooling stuff maybe a little more than they ought because uh, they all pretty much were. I mean, all the AKs we get. But like anything, they are out of production. No more will be coming in. And I will just end with saying, if you're looking at an Imadi, be aware that converting a, a Misser 10 to take standard mags is maybe more involved than you think. And just avoid the... The Misser 90 altogether. Trust me on this. You knew this was coming from the beginning of the video. Number two, Chinese guns. Oh, bully. Um, yeah, we've done entire videos on this. Once derided, then in the 21st century, they get put on an exceedingly high pedestal. And the truth is, in the middle. They are good, but they were made for a price point. Whereas those Steyr Mahdi's were $700 and up in the 80s, you could um, you could get a Chinese gun for about 300 bucks, 400 maybe with a machined receiver. Uh, some guys will say, well, I saw one in a thing for $99 or $149, they fucking saw an SKS. Okay, look, I'm just going to tell you, these were never $99 in the 80s. They, they just weren't. They're, they're mixing up SKS and AK. I, I've, I've traced those stories down at least half a dozen times now, and every damn time it either turns out to be a fabrication or an SKS. Anyway, I digress. But they were still cheap, and they were made for a price point. Now, the prepaying guns were pretty nice, and they imported them for several years, and they imported a lot of them. And then after the 89 ban, they continued to import them as Mac 90 and others up until April of 94. In over a 10-year import run, China says they brought over a million of these. So they are not rare by any stretch of the imagination. Now what the Chinese gun is, it's essentially an AK-47 because China never had the production tooling assistance to make the AKM. They did for the AK-47, the Type 56. But they replaced their machine receivers with a 1.5 millimeter 
stamped receiver and a new front trunnion style in the uh, late 60s. So basically it's an AK-47 type on a 1.5 stamped receiver. So it has the slightly heavier profile barrel, chrome lined, the pre-bands have threaded muzzles and bayonet lugs, post bands do not, and uh, yeah. Chinese guns, they are reliable, but they're far from bulletproof. I have never found the Chinese gun to be more or less durable or reliable than any other authentic import, be it Russian, Romanian, Hungarian, Bulgarian, what have you. On top of that, they have a blued finish, which I don't care it rusts. If you don't take decent care of these, I've seen more rusted out Chinese guns than any other gun, pre-ban or post. It was designed to look pretty. I don't know if the underlying metal wasn't treated in a way. It does seem like the Polytechs, which have a shinier blue, tend to rust a little easier than the Norinkos, which have more of a matte blue. But it does not protect against moisture all that well. I'm not saying no, don't get one. There's plenty of blue guns. What I'm saying is parkerized and paint finishes hold up better to the elements. If you get a Chinese gun with a blued finish, you have to be more mindful of where it's kept, moisture, and above all, corrosive ammo. Just know that. Likewise, some of them come with very pretty wood, at least to people. But for whatever reason... The wood does seem to be soft. I've seen more slightly... It just takes a ding more than um, a lot of other AK wood. For one thing, it's usually hardwood, not laminate. And laminate tends to be a little stronger. But it's a lighter wood, like physically. It's, it's lighter weight, and it just marks up more. It So it, too, again, is meant to look prettier than to be more durable. Now that said, other components like the trigger, the firing pin, all that, they they're they're military grade. So I don't I don't want to give you the impression that these aren't built tough. What I want to say is they're not built any tougher than anything else. People will bring up the 1.5 mil receiver. The thing is, when have you ever heard of a 1.0 millimeter receiver failing? The stamped receiver is just not the component that typically fails on an AK, even at very high round counts. So 1.5 sounds nice, but you're re really reinforcing an area that didn't necessarily need to be reinforced. China went with this style because they were going from a milled receiver to a stamped, and it just made sense logistically. Also, it gave them a little more flexibility in their manufacturing and steel usage. So, yeah, Chinese guns, nice, but they're not the legendary status that some put them out to be. And to be fair, the market is a little tamer on Chinese today in 2021 than it was, say, four or five years ago. Back then, people were going uh, cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs over some of these. So, yeah, and as far as, like, the legends with the machined receivers... They're nice. They really are. But as we pointed out in older videos, they are not a one-for-one -one copy of a Russian AK Type 3. For example, they still have a pressed and pinned barrel, not a threaded in. And they have a uh, three-rivet instead of five-rivet trigger guard. And they have a uh, cast front sight base instead of machined. Basically what they did, basically what they did was reverse the process. The Type 56 started off with a machined receiver. They made some changes to speed up production. They went to a stamped receiver. And then in the late 80s for the American market, they swapped the stamped receiver out for a machine one again. Perfectly fine. And they did make a few changes like going to the open front sight base and whatnot. But that was China's attempt to make a replica of a Russian gun and to make it at a relatively good price point. And they imported almost all of these guns en masse. Yeah, there are a few rare ones, sure, 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 like the Type 88. But most of your Chinese guns, 
were imported in vast numbers. My point is, don't don't overpay. Say, I want to pay this amount for one. And if you run an auction and it goes past what you want to pay, don't sweat it. There'll be another one down the road. They imported so many Chinese guns. More than you can imagine. I mean, we're talking about the Hungarians and, and the Egyptians coming in in a couple of thousands. Like I said, these came in in, in the hundreds of thousands. As many as a million, according to China, if you count the, uh, the the 90s ones. So, yeah, I really think the Chinese guns need to be respected, but also viewed in an appropriate light, you know, realistically. They were mass-produced for a low price point. If you look online, if you talk to military users of the select fire versions, they have some interesting things to say, too. Now, I will end by saying in the 80s, it seems like China did send us their higher-grade guns. But just keep in mind, these are still Chinese guns. And a lot of people do point out, oh, they were made in the same factories, blah, 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 and this is good. It is. So are the rest. So are Wasser's. So are Sega's. So are Arsenal's. These are all made in the same factories for the most part. So, yeah. Number two, I definitely think the Chinese guns are overrated. But that's not to say I don't like them. That is why I own three of them. Number one. This is interesting. Because it's also perhaps my number one favorite. Let me explain. The finish of Valmet. Really all Valmets. But of course the one I brought out is my M62S. I love this gun. I uh, wanted one for years and finally was able to grab one. In fact, at one time I had a small Valmet collection of uh, eight or so pieces. Now I'm down to two. You know, needs must and times change. But today, these are bringing bananas money. Much more than I paid or would pay. And uh, they're just not worth it. These are semi-automatic versions of their RK-62, a built tough rifle, machined receiver, cold hammer forged barrel, very unique muzzle device, other features that will later come up on the Galil. Fires 762 by 39 and stuff like that. But these were also not spiffed up for the American market. It, the, the bore is non chrome lined. Now, normally that wouldn't bug me, but these guns have been in country longer than I've been alive, or longer than probably a lot of you have been alive. And Unfortunately, corrosive ammo was very common back in the 80s and 90s, and people shot more than a few of these, not cleaning them properly, meaning today when you pick one up, be sure to inspect the bore. Also, they have a very utilitarian phosphate parkerized finish. This is not an attractive paint over part. They're not blue. It's a very kind of... Intentionally coarse, rough finish. On top of that, things like the uh, the bolt travel, they are very smooth, but not the best I've ever felt on an AK. And the triggers are odd on these. They're a very straight trigger. They definitely take some getting used to. Um... By modern sensibilities, they're meh. Back then, they were probably one of the nicer AK triggers, to be fair. But today, yeah, the triggers are not one that's going to bowl you over, frankly. And of course, mine here has the original furniture. I love it for what it is, being original. And this forearm is surprisingly comfortable, even if it doesn't look it. But this pistol grip, eh, not so much. 
In this buttstock, um, it gets the job done, but it's a metal tube, so yeah, it's not the most comfortable furniture. But let's talk about some other things, kind of the Valmat series in general. They have issues. When they kind of went away from this furniture style, for example, with the M71, the polymer used there and used through some of the other guns is extremely brittle today. For example, a lot of the polymer butt plates you'll find are cracked. And that's not because someone abused it, it's just because they crack. Furthermore, the, the guns that came in with fixed polymer buttstocks, those entire stocks are often cracked. So much so that many of them were replaced with wood stocks even back in the 70s and 80s. So if you get one with a fixed polymer stock, be very careful with it. And I'm not sure I'd shoot it with that stock, especially if it's a 308 version. There have also been issues with firing pins breaking. Now, mostly you hear about those in the 223 version. But recently I heard of a couple of 762x39s also breaking their firing pins. Now, in the 762x39, I would imagine you can make at least some AK firing pin fit. But in 223, I'm not sure where you would get the replacement part. And that would suck. So, you might be mindful of shooting one of these today and things like that. Furthermore, the magazines. Now, the 760x39s are good. They take regular AK mags. If you want the true finish mags, those are a little hard to find. But, it's just a design choice. However, with the 223 mags, a lot of people want to use Galils in them. You really shouldn't. There's a whole reason why. But anyway, let's just say you want the original finish 223 mags. Good luck. Um, they made them in steel, 15 and 30 rounds. You're going to spend a couple hundred bucks for a 15 and at least 300, 400 for a 30 rounder. That's because they never imported them with mini mags. 308 may be even worse. Um, most of them you find are 20 rounds. But the problem is there were two different patterns, and different 308 valve mats take different magazines. There's kind of a, a wide and a narrow one. So if you get a 308 valve mat, make sure you know which of the two mag varieties it'll take. If you have a gun that takes the wide mags, the narrow ones will fit, but they'll wiggle around. If you have one that only takes the narrow mags, the wide ones, obviously, they won't even fit. So... Of the two, you're better off with that, but a lot of it has to do with the stamped versus milled receiver thing. And that's kind of my other point. Valmets are not all created equal. This one's on a machined receiver. In the 80s, they also went back to a machined receiver, although it didn't have the lightning cuts. In the 70s, though, they played around with stamped receivers. The uh, M71 has a 1.0 stamped receiver. They found that to be too lightweight, so they went to a slightly beefed up stamped receiver for the M76, but then they, had, like I said, eventually went back to a machined receiver. So be mindful that not all valve mats are machined. In fact, a lot of them are stamped. Also be very mindful of the magazine issue. They just never imported them in large numbers, unfortunately. And the valve mat wasn't even blocked by any ban, really. I mean, it was part of the 89 ban, but that didn't really matter because the production line was over. Valve mat had already previously... Uh, shut down and even sold off its firearms division. So even without a ban in 89, these were no longer coming in. But of course, Valmets are extremely uncommon, rare today. So people put them on a pedestal like they're the finest made Kalashnikovs ever, and they're just not. The machining quality on these is very high. It's also military grade. So there might be a machining mark or two. There might be a loose rear sight top cover or one that's too tight. There, You know, a lot of times the gas tubes are loose on these. That's fine. It's a military-grade gun. Uh, my uh, night set on this one's kind of stuck in the down position. I need to work on it. Things like that. You know, things... They, they were made to a military spec. They were not, you know... Uh, 
from God to Kalashnikov to, uh, you type thing. They, uh, yeah, they're nice, but they're not just amazing. So if you buy one for $6,000 or more, expecting zero issues, you're going to be disappointed. Because truth is, you're going to find one. On top of that, yeah, they don't have chrome line barrels, and the plastic or the polymer is brittle. So, know about that. Also, firing pins. You might want to check your firing pin. Be mindful of that. And magazines. Um, yeah, the 7.62x39s take regular AK mags. Unfortunately, the 7.62x39s are the least common of the three calibers. So, most likely, you'll pick up a 223 or a 308. If you do, make sure you have mags for it. And don't fall for Galil mags or shittily converted mags for the 308. Make sure you have good mags for them because a gun really is only as reliable as the device that feeds it. It's kind of like the you are what you eat type situation. But yeah, I, the, the Valmet has taken on mythical proportions. And I think it needs to be kind of brought back down to reality. And the funny thing is, if you ask me to do a top five video of my favorite AKs, this would certainly be in there. So, I'm not dogging on it. I love it. But, I'm realistic about it. And if you notice, the, the guns in this video are all ones that are either banned or just not being imported anymore. That's because people, A, want what they can't have, and that drives the price up, and B... Like I said at the beginning, when they only see pictures of a gun, when they just see it online and hear it talked about, when they don't feel it, when they don't shoot it, they tend to ascribe it with mythical attributes. That's human nature. I think we all do that. So, not knocking it. I'm just being realistic. And that's kind of the point of this video. These are guns that have been kind of overhyped, and I want to bring them back down to reality. And with that, I'll put it out to you. What AKs today do you think are overhyped, overblown, or overpriced? Uh, put them in the comments and we can have a fun little discussion. I thought with the way the AK market is in 2021, this would be an apt time to do this kind of a video. With that, we greatly appreciate you tuning in. If you could, like, share, and subscribe. And if you'd like to help support the channel, please check out the link to our Patreon page. This is Misha. And we'll catch you very soon next time.